Hey everybody, welcome to Behind the Bar, where we interview your favorite dry bar comedians. My name is Danny Johnson. I'm your host. Joining me, as you can see, is the uh, uh, wonderfully talented Jeff Allen, who's uh, has a continues to have a very accomplished career. Three dry bar specials. This is just as of late. Um, TV. Can't, I've, I, I think I remember seeing you on A and E night at the Improv. I cannot remember. Yeah. Um, and then just your new, I don't think this is your first book, but your, your, uh, are we there yet is his latest book, which it's, you can see it's marked up and highlighted. I got a bunch of, I learned a lot from that book. I'll tell you that, but thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. A, um, A and E. Wow. That was quite a while ago. I had, I had full head of hair back then. I, yeah. I mean, that was my first taste of kind of stand up was, um, you know, I, I remember even seeing Michael Keaton on yeah. there. You know, he yeah. started in stand up, but that and then I think Caroline Leifer had a show and then MTV's half hour comedy. I was all those, you know, right. kind of get a glimpse. of. Some, I remember seeing Kevin Hart on like premium blend doing 15. Oh, wow. Set, you know, but wow. anyway, I think I remember you and um, it's good to have you. Nice to be here, man. I it's think we're good. working together. Yeah. Up. yeah. Looking forward to it. In November, Jacksonville. Good time there. I wish I'm getting rotator cuff surgery in a week, so I won't be bringing my golf clubs in November. Right. But, uh, I, I've so it? tried to get into golf. I think I've missed out on career opportunities because I can't get into golf. It's funny you say that. When I was a kid, I played a lot of baseball, and my father put a golf club in my hand when I get nine, and I learned to play. And he says, you, and you may not appreciate it now, but at some point in your life, you're going to have to do business on a golf course. Yeah, so you might as well learn how to hold a club and, and swing the club and – and uh, it's interesting. Everything you learn as a child, you you hold on to. And I didn't really play much after you know after my uh, teen years, yeah. Uh, just because of the expense, we had no money. And then I took it back up when I got back on the road. And then I got sober. And then I, you know I just <laughs> traded in my alcohol and drug addiction for golf. And I went you know completely in uh, both feet in on it and got a little over sideways with it. But yeah, uh, you mentioned that in your book that the golf yeah. became an extreme to the point where at one point you called your son, like, come get me. Yeah. At that was, that game. was it. And people don't believe, I mean, they go, really? I go, absolutely, man. I like six or seven different times. I left the range to get to the car and I started to take the clubs off the car and I go, I got, I got to go back to this. Yeah. I can't go home though, hitting a ball like this. And the, and the, 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 the the thing is, anybody who plays golf knows the more tired you get, the more angry you get. You know, you can't, your body doesn't function. Your mind is warped. Right. You know, it, that's the time you step, you should step away for a week, right. not just, you know, get off the range. So anyway, yeah, my kid came, he looked at me like with side eyes. And I said, they don't even remember. I, I quit drinking when Ryan was one. Yeah. So he doesn't know what the addiction looks like. <laughs> right. Yeah, you just picture clip. you like at the on the side of a clubhouse in a golf course, like shaking, and you, you're like pretend smoking yeah. golf tees. Like somebody come <laughs> get me. Yeah, I can't tap in my arm. You know, come on, man, I need, I need it some more. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is that we were close to it's close to dusk anyway. At some point, they're going to shut the range down. I would have been forced. Yeah, and I probably would have got arrested. You know, like. They, yeah. they used to throw me out of bars at, you know, whatever closing time was. You got to go, Jeff, you know, and I go, yeah, oh, yeah just a six pack. Give me a six pack for the road. You, know? <laughs> you might get a kick out of this. Uh, I did. I, I mentioned I'm not a golfer. I, I can't get into it, but I did a commercial for Mitsubishi um, and it was co-starred Fred Funk. The, the, oh, the golfer yeah, right. Jacksonville, right? Yeah, it was in, we were in St. Augustine at the World Golf Village and, uh, you know, the Murray's yeah. place, the Murray Brothers place. And, uh, so the idea was I go, I nod to Fred Funk. I go over in one shot. And by the way, they cast someone intentionally that was bad at golf. They said, you cannot be good at golf. I said, I'm your guy. Well, I'm your guy. So they yeah. go, listen, just you nod to Fred Funk, go up to the tee, settle yourself, take a swing. And I want you to slice it right. And CGI will take care of the rest. But I just need you to hit the ball to the right. I'm like, I have no idea where it's going to go. Right. And he goes, sun's coming down. Not a lot of filming time left. Let's make sure you get this right. And and freeze on the you know when you're done with your yeah, freeze. Yeah. So I uh I go up there and nod to Fred Funk, he nods at me, and I, I swing and freeze and I look and the ball goes dead center, like 150, 175 yards. <laughs> <laughs> and I, all I hear is because there's all these PGA tour production folks, they're filming it behind right. me, and all I hear is 
like the slow clap started and then everybody was just clapping like, Hey, that was great, but we don't, we can't use that. Right. They go, turn your, turn the face up. Open. Right. And then sure enough, second shot went to the right, but, uh, maybe you're a natural man. You have a, right. I never forget. Like it was freezing cold and, uh, you, you kind of get a sense of where you stand on the set. Cause every time they yelled cut, people would rush to Fred Funk with a blanket and hot chocolate, literally <laughs> pushing me out of the way. Yeah, exactly. Like, get out of the way. Yeah. Go, go over there by the pond. Yeah. My first real big gig, uh, was opening for Conway Twitty in Chicago. Um, it's actually Maryville, Indiana at the holiday star. Never did it before. Never got a, a job like that. And I go into the theater, you know, early, of course, and go sit in the dressing room and I rip open the fruit basket. And I'm eating the fruit and everything. And some guy comes by and goes, who are you? I go, I'm Jeff Allen. I'm opening for Mr. Twitty. He goes, yeah, but what are you doing here? I go, what do you mean? He goes, this is Conway's dressing room. <laughs> Took me to a broom closet, and I'm not make that's not a lie. It was literally a broom closet. They opened yeah. the door, they put a stool in a, you know, a three foot wide, four foot deep uh, yeah. closet, and they go, "You sit here until we call you, man." <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I opened. I wanted, so now I get fruit, and when I, that's on my rider, and wherever I go, I get a fruit basket. You yeah. know, sometimes it's four strawberries. They that's how they honor the commitment. You know, right, right. They've honored you. Didn't you didn't specify how much fruit? Right? Yeah, I was doing a corporate once, and I I put in there like power bars or uh, some protein bar because if my blood sugar drops, you know, I'm, I'm kind of crotchety anyway by nature. <laughs> But it gets really bad if I'm if the if I and I can I can snap you know I have no patience if especially a corporate would be bad if I lost it right so anyway I, I figure I can I can nosh on a power bar within if I'm late you know if the flight's late whatever so that's why I put it in the contract well I had one of those days where I could get barreling through the door and yeah man I'm just wired uh just you know blood sugar everything man and I'm just on edge I'm looking for my writer i'm the fruit something nothing 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 anyway I, they introduce me i go up i do the show you know it's fine and i'm walking off the stage and on stage behind me was a banana four or five grapes a strawberry and a power there you go <laughs> that was it they fulfilled the writer but they put it on the stage i mean what, what good is that to, what i'm gonna eat that while i'm working you right. know I'll right. tell you what I would have if I had seen it. I certainly would have ate the four grapes. Right. Yeah, let me tell you a little <laughs> bit about that. He's eating a strawberry. Yeah, that was uh, nice of him. I thought I, w I opened for Christopher Titus once at Emory Riddle University in T in Daytona. It was like two thousand people in a gymnasium. My biggest show to to to, to yeah. that to that point in my career. And I go meet him, and he's in the men's basketball or men's locker room, sports locker room. And he's got this huge lunch meat spread with cheeses and the sodas oh. and waters. And then we were talking and it kind of got a little weird. You know, I just met him. And was, so the, the security's like, oh, let me take you to your dressing room. I'm like, oh, I can't wait. So I go and mine's in a a conference room <laughs> that's super small. And there was like a, a can of Coke and a bag of chips just like le leaning up against the can of Coke and like the a phone yeah. that was unplugged and the light was sort of hanging. They're like, you just hang out here, buddy. Well, the funniest song I heard about all that was Joan Rivers. I read her biography and uh, she was forced to buy coffee uh, at a strip club. She was working in Boston. She was just starting out. So in her contract, I think it was 15 pots of coffee was required in her dressing room. Jeez. Yeah, someone talk about holding a grudge, you know. So it's like all the people today pay the price for all the people in the past in your life that were jerks, you right. know. And uh, I don't. Again, I I have a rhyme and a reason to what I put in there. I I you know I don't have the you know I don't care about the M and M's or anything. I just right. uh, you know some kind of sugar fruit and, and a power of protein and um, and then I think we had Red Bull on it. Uh, Brad Stein, I worked with him. I never really heard of Red Bull. And Brad would hit the Red Bull right before the show. And I, I, I did one one night. You know, I'm a cocaine meth meth uh, meth addict. And, you know, so right. and caffeine has, you know, the, uh, you know, I do a joke in my show about not talking to my wife for 30 minutes in the morning. I said, you know, I, I, oh, yeah, I yeah. said, if you can imagine my brain being a car in Chicago winter in January and every sip of cocaine is a crank. Rrr, 
Right. Every <laughs> <laughs> you know, thirty minutes in, it's like mm, I'm awake, man. Let's go. Right. We can have we can talk about the day, whatever. But I need that thirty minutes. I don't think Brad Stein. I've seen his show. I've never met him, but I don't think he needs caffeine. I don't. <laughs> No, Brad's a, I'll tell you what, man, I had so much fun with him. Um, uh, we did a court tour called The Apostles of Comedy. And it was me, Ron Pearson, Anthony Griffith, and uh, who Anthony I knew from Chicago when I started. And then Brad. And uh, we did a bus tour. We did about 18 dates, I guess. And it's as close as I've ever come to camp. I mean, you know, I, I was never, in camp. I mean, it was just the four of us on a bus. And uh, had some really deep discussions about you know, theology and stuff and the other, you know, sports, whatever, man. I mean, it was just really, it's great to go out with four, three other guys that you respect. You respect their craft. You yep. respect what they do. And then uh, as men, you respect them. So it was really kind of cool. It's just so darn expensive to run a bus and, uh, For sure. and four, four guys that, um, you know, um, split the check four ways and, you um, yeah, you, know, you really got to sell out and, and price. Well, it was a lot easier, price. like for Foxworthy, because Foxworthy and Engvall, the two of them combined, uh, at that when they started, were able to fill, you know, three four thousand seats, and uh, that that pays the freight. You know, yeah, um, yeah. we weren't there, but it was fun. <laughs> so I re so one you have three dry bar specials. One of them I, I have re four actually. There's two in a can. Oh, we, wow. we released one and we took it back out. It was really kind of upsetting because there was about a minute and a half on Joe Biden in there that I thought was funny. Was that the Gunsmoke uh, and... Um... Yeah, Gunsmoke and Ice Cream and the Starbucks thing. That's out there. Um, oh, is it? Is it? Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if they released it or not. But yeah. um, And then there's I... another one I shot back in March that's still sitting wow. um, somewhere. So... um. Yeah, um, I, I wish I could reshoot it. I'm going to talk to them. If they haven't released it, I'd love to go back at my even my own expense and shoot it again. Because, you know, you know, you know, when you're putting these things together, you know, the first two were easy because it was all stuff that I had done before. That was one of the um, when my manager called me. It's funny. I just finished the tour with Brad Upton. And Upton was introducing himself, having being introduced with a uh, hundred million views. And I'm going, what the heck is that? And he goes, it's dry bar. I go, what is it? He goes, well, it's this thing in Provo and blah, blah. I go, okay. So not long after that, my manager called me and said, I got you. I booked you on dry bar. And I, we were, I was working stuff to, and we were trying to pitch Netflix. And I said, I'm not burning the stuff we, you know, cause Netflix won't let me, you know, right. they won't take stuff that's on some other platform. He goes, no, they don't care. Do the happy wife, happy life, do whatever you want, man. They don't care. They can, so I, well, if that's the case, then let it rip, man. So anyway, um, I hired a social media guy um, that I couldn't afford mm -hmm. right away because I told my wife, if if this hits, I want everything in place. I don't want to be playing catch up to the to the to the views if it hits, right. right. And then I get there in January and I tape and I said, uh, so when are you going to release this? They said, August. I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't pay this guy for eight more months. Right. And to put it in perspective, um, that was, uh, um, I think middle of February, I called my financial guy. I looked at my calendar. I had no work, literally not one day wow. in the summer, not one. And it doesn't mean there wouldn't be a couple here and there, but normally we're six, seven months. I mean, I can look ahead and go, it's going to be a good summer or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he said, well, let me know if you need some money. And I, I, I thought I'd probably have to pull out in May sometime to get through the month, summer. And uh, Jai Bar called us uh, near the end of February and said, uh, we're going to release this in March. We, we really like it. We like what it is. And anyway, uh, my wife was keeping track of everything. It was I likened it to doing the Tonight Show in the 70s and Johnny Carson tapping you on the shoulder and bringing you over to the couch. Your life changed overnight. And that's really what happened to me with Dry Bar. I mean, it was, I mean, I couldn't get over it. Uh, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million, you know, and it's like, who's watching this stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then my manager called and said, Jeff, I'm telling you, we're getting 15 inquiries a day now um, amazing. for work, you know? Yeah, well, that's, it, and uh, more importantly was the perception. Um, um, he said to me, he goes, you know, it used to be people calling, go, I want Jeff for this date, blah, blah, blah. And then now they're calling, go, can I get him? 
uh, for this date. Uh, uh. Is he too busy? Is he? I, I hope we can get him. Can we? I mean, the whole everything changed because of that, and um, I was blown away. Absolutely, to this day, I'm still blown away. I mean, I go out and I work, and um, you know, I never. I I told my management 20 years ago, I'm not going back into comedy clubs. Yeah. Uh, I just said, I'm tired of babysitting drunks. And if I can draw an audience and I can bring them into the club, then I'll go. And thanks to dry bar, you know, I'm doing probably half of my work now is in clubs, just finished a nice run up in upstate New York. Yeah. Syracuse, right? Yeah. Yeah. Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, Manchester. And now uh, we're going to do it in reverse. Uh, they keep telling me I got to go back in the winter because up north, the weekend, you know, the, the the clubs just don't do much in the summer. The summers are so short. You know, that was my opening line in Rochester. I walked out and said, uh, so uh, what is it going to, you know, another week it starts snowing here? I mean, week and a half. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, and we're in August. So anyway, next year we're going in the spring. We're going Boston, which I have not been back really since I moved there. I moved out of there in the eighties. I'm looking forward. I love Boston, but we're going Boston, Manchester. Um, we're going in reverse, Manchester, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, and then Cleveland hilarities. And, um, uh, it's a nice run. I love it. Cause I drive. Uh, I, 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 I don't know about you, but I can't stand going to the airport anymore. Yeah. If I, if I can avoid it, I told my manager five hours, any, any direction and living in Nashville, that covers St. Louis, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Atlanta, um, Arkansas, uh, a pretty wide swath, five hour drive from my yeah. house. So, um, uh, a number of dates I'm in the car and, uh, I'm getting shoulder surgery in another week and a week, probably another week. Yeah. 29th. Uh, I don't know when this is going to air probably after the, after the surgery. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm holding my arm now. Like I would have surgery. Oh my God. I just had surgery. It was awful. Yeah. <laughs> you know? so, so anyway, um, she's got to drive me, uh, my wife, uh, to, uh -huh. to the dates in, in Georgia three nights. And, uh, we're going to make a big splash on social media that, uh, she's, she's coming out of hiding. So yeah. You better, if you want to ever see her, man, this is, these are the dates. Yeah, uh, that's funny you say that because watching your three specials. So the first one, I can laugh about it now. That was the 40 minute one. Cause when I did mine, yeah in 19 it was also the longer one and then the and subsequently they reduced it right. you know the newer ones are and then honor thy wife and then gun smoke and ice cream but watching those and then reading your book over the past couple of uh, 10 12 days i was like i i got to what is this what do his sons look like what does tammy look like what is this you know you kind of feel like you know you well, that's why she hides uh because you know you I, you create a picture yeah or everybody has a picture you know and, um, you know, like she said, I don't want to disappoint anybody. And I said, I don't think you'd disappoint them. I just think they'd go, oh, that's not what I imagine. I mean, it, it changes everything. There was, a, I don't know about you, but I don't know how old you are. But I grew up uh, when FM really just started in Chicago. Okay. And they had these sultry voices of these women. Right. Welcome, 98.4.5. <laughs> and I remember, man, it was this one girl. I, I can't remember her name, but I mean, I listened to her. And I, you know, I'm a teenager. I had all these yeah, yeah. fantasies about which, and I saw her, man. She had like sweatpants on. Right. <laughs> it's about 265 pounds. <laughs> right. you know? Oh, man, you need to stay behind the mic, man. I, and, and, you know, yeah yeah don't don't come out because that, right. that ruined everything for me i couldn't even listen to her you got a face for, her, you, know, I go, eh. you, you got know, a face for was, radio ma'am absolutely so what a voice though what a voice yeah speaking of voices i have to um i have to get rid of a line of mine in my act we have similar thought process you talked about um so the, the line in my act, act currently is, I love to make people laugh. My favorite group of people to make laugh are longtime smokers. And that gets a little chuckle. Mm -hmm. And then I go, because it never ends. And I, you know, I, I, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I say, I tell a joke and, they, and they, I do a pretend laugh. And then I do the, <laughs> you know, the, oh. and it yeah, makes me feel funnier than I am. And then yeah, in, you in the book, I think in even your special and in your book, you're like, you talked about Tammy and that's how you know that recognizable laugh from the back of the comedy club. Yeah. And I recall it, uh, with my dad. Um, uh, I say my dad, I talk about it at the end. I do a Wayne Newton story. Yeah. And, uh, I said, I go to Vegas. Uh, my dad went to Vegas. My dad was a, a hard audience 
But um, and but he, I talk about it in the book. I think we call them dark days. He'd go in his room and sit, never diagnosed, but sure looked a lot like bipolar or whatever. And um, anyway, uh, he'd come down and we'd listen to uh, the Cosby albums and the Woody Allen album on the. Um, uh, and I highly recommend anybody who's a comedy fan to dig up that Woody Allen comedy album, man. It's yeah. it's classic. Uh, anyway, uh, and my father would sit in the living room and laugh, and I go to. <laughs> And then I go, well, I think I married my father. I think I was, and then I start walking towards the laugh. You're like, I'm going at the club going, I, I'd hear her laughing going, Oh, dad, is this you dad? <laughs> you yeah. know? And I ended up marrying her. So, uh, but yeah, I wouldn't, if I were you, I wouldn't take it out. I mean, it's again, I don't, to me, one of those things, it's not, you can give five comics who write their own stuff, the same premise and right. you'll get, five similar but different takes on it yeah and you know i mean i used to watch guys when i headlined the clubs and they had an opener middle and a and, and me and i'd watch the opener and he'd have you know seven and a half minutes of just slop and then there'd be this brilliant clever thing in there and someone would lean over and go yeah that was the headliner last week was here with that uh -huh. you know and you go man you know and you walk up he's, and, and it used to be police than it isn't anymore but to me um if you can't write your own stuff um you're gonna have a short career you know the internet will give you a, a blast now you can put something out but yeah. um uh you know i was told by gaither when i started touring with him he said the problem i have with comedians is they don't have enough material he said though my audience will hear the same song 30 times they don't care yeah they don't want to hear the joke same joke 30 and and i did the same 12 to 15 minutes for on and yeah. off for the seven years i toured with him because I had to sell merch and the merch I had, that stuff was on the merch. Yep. You know, the last thing they want to do is, you know, here's something and then go home and go, it's not there, you know, right. um, you know, and uh, so and it's interesting. I'm, I'm kind of at a point. I'm thinking of doing this. I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are on it, but um, uh, people have their favorite bits of mine and they get up. They don't get upset. They just go, Oh, you didn't do the wee papa. You didn't do the, right. You know, the Volkswagen, you didn't do the whatever. And um, I just thought we'd put it out. What are your favorite bits? Take the top 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and then do a, I can string them together. I can make a best of. Yeah. And then just take that out live. Just go here, here, you're, you know, you know, these, these things. Cause I'm, I'm always adding stuff. And then I realize I get to, I look at the phone cause I take my phone up as a timer. I go, oh crap, I'm in an hour. You know, yeah. and then I got to wrap it. I got to start wrapping it up. I got to sell the book. I got to, and um, I didn't do this, this, and this. You know, I just started doing the Wayne Newton story again because I, I love that. I mean, yeah. it's one of my favorite things I do. <laughs> just, I liked it a lot. Yeah, when you look at the, yeah, when you look at the crowd and go, yeah, you're, you're, you're my favorite. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> What's so you would, know, uh, you would... funny. I, I never saw, I never saw Wayne Newton live. I'm doing this, confessing this publicly, right. but. Uh, a friend of mine told me that he saw Wayne Newton like three nights in a row and all three nights he said, uh, you're the best crowd ever. That's so funny. Hey, I can't do that. Can you do that? Would you be able to do that every night? Just go, oh my gosh, man, you guys are the great. I don't think my audience, I, I think they'd look at me and go, we just lost a lot of respect for you. We, yeah. we really did. I do it. Sometimes I do it sarcastically if they're not, you know, if I'm not a hundred, they're not a hundred percent with me or whatever. Yeah. You know, and it'll oh, get that, that. Yeah. Then you can pick up on it. That the best line I ever heard on that. I was in Boston, and it was Frank Santarelli. We were working a, a Chinese restaurant, and uh, it was a terrible night weather, weather wise, a snowstorm or whatever. It was like thirty five or forty people, and I went up. I and bombed miserably. The next guy goes up and bombs miserably. I mean, Tony V. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Tony. I don't. I don't want to chop up who whose line it was, but. Right. He said, uh, yeah, he's about 20 minutes into or 15 because you only did 15, 20. So he's probably 15 minutes into a 20 minute set. And he looks at him and he goes, you know, if this place was full, I sat about 400 people. He said, uh, you got to figure 10 percent, which is, you know, 40, you know, wouldn't like what we were doing. But who would have ever thought you would all the only people who would have showed up would be the 40 that we wouldn't like what we were doing. And I we all busted up in the back. I thought, what a yeah. great observation to make. You know, yeah, you're right. 10% of the people just aren't gonna dig it. And who would have thought those were the 10% that showed up, you know? Right. 
we could have lived with 50-50, 20, you know, 20 people laughing would have been good. I've seen, uh, not live, but I've seen Rodney Dangerfield look at somebody in the front that's not laughing and go, just simply go, these are the jokes. This is yeah. what, this is it. This is all. There's no I saw him one up. night and I've used this. Um, and I, I don't feel that Rodney would be upset with me. Uh, he was doing his thing, and it was a nightmare. It was a comics nightmare. They had two busloads of Canadians that uh, drove down from uh, Windsor, Canada, yeah. to see him at Merrillville and uh, listen to all his stuff on tape. They were beating him to the punchlines oh. of his jokes, and he, you know, he has the kind of stuff you can go, yeah, you know, you know, the button fell off, yeah, and they would scream out the punch, and people were yelling, "Shut up, shut up!" You know, it yeah. was chaos. Well, anyway, two guys get up in the middle of all of that, and they they start walking out of the building. And Rodney stops talking, and he watches them, and the whole room gets quiet watching these two guys walk out. Yeah. And he looked at the crowd. He goes, I'm doing better. They used to run out. <laughs> <laughs> and I did that the other night. I was somewhere, and uh, and I, was, I had stopped talking, and some guy took that as an opportunity to stand up in, in front row. And go out, and I sat there. I watched him, watched him, watched him. Looked at the crowd and going, doing better. They used to run out, and uh, and then I gave Rodney the props. I go, thank you, Rodney. I said, thank you, Rodney. You know? That's amazing. That's I love that line. Oh my god, classic. Yeah. You mentioned your dad at one of the first sort of uh, chuckles in a dark situation I got in your book. I have it highlighted. Was, um. You know, you kind of grew up watching the way your dad treated your mom and then your mom got sick and he's taking care of her in such a gentle, sweet way. And yeah. I think in the book, you mentioned something to the fact where you thank him for treating your mom so well, like it's a new thing, yeah. which it was. And, right. and he was he was like, what the heck are you talking about? No right. Idea. Yeah. I used to say to, uh, to Christians, you know, I'd meet them and they'd go, you know, did you ever forgive your father? I go, well, I can tell you that. Yeah, I did. But if I ever went to him and said, I forgive you, he'd go for what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, to him, there was nothing he ever did in his life negatively that wasn't right. somebody else's fault. You know? Right. So, yeah. My favorite line in the book, by the way, it was my mom with her sense of humor. When my father blamed God for everything, but he was an atheist and he didn't see the irony in that. Right. And uh, anyway, they get caught at a train. It was God's made the train come you know all these red lights you know and at yeah, one yeah. point she catches a red light my mother looks at him and goes oh look jack god made another light red that's and when i i just when i remembered that i just remembered laughing i just yeah that was mom you know she just poked him and you know my father i don't know if i put it in the book it probably not because it's uh, you know racist it, again that generation you know yeah. um uh but uh he always blamed <laughs> a person's race for their broken down cars, you know? Wow. And um, yeah, always just that. Ah, yes, yeah. Anyway, one, one day we're sitting on Lakeshore drive and inching along in traffic and we could see the cars hoods up. And anyway, as we inch by the car, my mother looked at my dad and goes, Oh, look, Jack, he's white. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and my father, yeah, I just, yeah, my dad was, uh, it, it, my friends loved him playing golf with him. Um, I, I had too much baggage to enjoy the the tirades and everything. But in hindsight, yeah. just telling, we, we used to sit around and tell dad stories uh, as a family, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah, he was a character. I have, uh, it, my stepfather raised me, but I have a relationship with both men right a good relationship with healthy yeah. relationship with both but my stepfather what i remember from him he's a very quiet guy uh growing up and but he would he would get agitated for weeks months and we wouldn't know it until somebody left the milk out on the counter for 90 minutes you know <laughs> and then he would yell about that you know who let them and it would just be yeah. a zero to ten and it's Still really not about the, the top, milk right yeah it's never about the yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i gotta be and my, my son now it's so my 18 uh my son's 18 and, and it's him just him and i in the house and and he'll recognize if i'm a little agitated he's like what's going on you know because i'll, I'll oh. snap at him or something yeah. or something so small and he's like what what do you what, what's happening right now are you overwhelmed what's going yeah. on right my little therapist yeah a little cranky that's all i love the line about cranky. your first time on stage uh though the second time when you go back and the the staff was like um, we're still trying to figure out what you set up there. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was a little trashed. It was the Thanksgiving night, and I got drunk at my parents' house and uh, decided yeah. this was it because uh, uh, open mics were Thursdays and Sundays. So I'm driving by the club, and I go, hey, I think I'll sign up for open mic. And, I mean, yeah. I had gone from August to November without the courage to try it. So I had really nothing planned. I had some magic stuff in the car, and I went out and tried to do a magic trick and pop the balloon and, blah, you know, and anyway. And, right. Yeah, and then go back Sunday. And the Orlando Rays, very large black man, came over and said, you're going to have to make some sense. <laughs> we're, we're still trying to figure out what you said Thursday. Night. Right, because I like it. The whole lead-up to it, it is... It was a week I... before I saw Larry Reeve writing in a notebook. And I said to Larry, what are you doing? He goes, I'm preparing my set. I go, you write this stuff down. He goes, you don't? I go, no, I just thought you went up and talked about your day. He goes, that explains a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, first big laugh I ever got was uh the Volkswagen. Um I had a beat up old bug. I had to park it on a hill because I couldn't afford to get the uh, starter fixed on it. And yeah. uh, I'd have to run it down the hill, pop the clutch and go. And I was late for an open mic night and ran in uh just pumped up, jacked up, ticked off, hit the stage and just started spewing about this VW bug. And at some point I realized oh my God, they're laughing. And then made a note, I made a note. I go, comedy's truth. And it's anxiety, yeah, and uh, and anger. You know, Joan Rivers said it. Comedy is anger. As long as it stays around forty nine percent of your personality, you can get away with it. But if it gets to be fifty one percent, then the audience will be turned off because you're too angry. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's 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 comics out there that I like, but I I can only take in small doses because they're it just makes me tense and, and you know they're so angry and yelling and constantly and for an hour. And I'm like, <laughs> The funniest one was Emo. Uh, I, I had known Emo for years, and uh, I, I brought my sister out to see him. And uh, she's laughing hard for about 15 minutes, and then she stops laughing. And then at some point, she leans over. She goes, he's really like that, isn't he? This isn't an <laughs> Is he? I don't know. I never met him. It, it's an act. But, I, you know, but he's, he's deep in character a lot. Yeah, and uh, yeah. it took us a while to get past hello. Cause I'd go hello and he'd go, eh, you know, and I just walk by. I go, you know, and uh, one day I went hello, hey, well, how you doing? He goes, yeah, I'm doing okay, John. And, and uh, it was, it was, it was Phil. And he changed his name like every other week. Um, Phil Sultanic, Phil Ahab, Phil Ajax, Phineas Ahab, Phineas Ajax. Uh, you know, and then finally settled on Emo Phillips. I think Emo Farquhar was one for. He had one of the funniest hooks you'd ever want to see. He'd stand on stage, assemble and disassemble a trombone and never play it throughout <laughs> his whole show. And he'd look like he was going to play, and then he'd start taking the mouthpiece off and putting it back in the case, <laughs> close up the case, and he'd tell a few jokes, then he'd open the case, pull out the thing, and eventually somebody would yell out, play it, play it, my God, play it. And he'd, he'd just be, you know, like, what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. Very funny, very funny guy, man. Very but, funny guy. There's a... Um... The only thing I've ever seen similar is uh, Blake Clark at the Comedy Zone came into town and he dressed in his golf gear. He brought up all his clubs on stage, you know, and he had the, the bag with the kickstand. Yeah. And he just put the clubs up on stage and then never addressed it, never talked oh, about really? golf, never did anything. And then at the end of his set, he put the golf bag on. <laughs> down the That's back. great. I never knew that. That's great. I like that stuff. These are, they're, they're thought out. They're planned. I mean, it's not spontaneous, and um, I like that. And you'd have to ask them why. You know? The only prop I ever had on stage ever, and I would love to bring it back, is it? I just maybe it gets the fond memories of my early days. But you know, the buzzers you get at a restaurant that uh, light up when your right. table's ready. Well, I'm yeah. not proud to say, but I I uh, I borrowed one. Oh. <laughs> And I would bring it on stage, and that's how I would open. I'd be like, you know, I got to make this quick. I'm waiting on the table at Outback. <laughs> that's actually funny. That is. Yeah, I remember uh, Gary Shanley, who was certainly by no means a prop guy, opened a Tonight Show set with a pen with a big chain on it and said, look at this. These are free at the bank. Right. <laughs> <laughs> great? I, well, I, was, yeah. I, I still have the thing, the restaurant thing with me. I, I want to get a, somebody to 
to rig it as a timer. So at the end, so at 60 minutes. Right. Oh, that would be great. It buzzes and I go, oh, my table's ready. I got to get out of here. Yeah, it's got to be a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth thing. Or, sure, I, I don't know. Yeah. But you, you mentioned earlier your um, wife's going to have to drive you for a little bit on some road gigs. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm only assuming answer. it's better than the four seasons you stayed at at your honeymoon. We didn't stay at the four seasons. We I know. stayed at the deer. Yeah, it was double wide. Yeah. Yeah, we talk about that even even now. You know, it's so funny. Um, I had to go buy a new bed uh, for this arm surgery. They wanted me, um, they told me I'd have to get a, it was funny, I said to my son, this is how old I am. I said, I need to get a Barker lounger. And he goes, what's a Barker lounger? I go, you, you have no idea. You don't know what a Barker lounger? He goes, no. And he's 40. Right. How do you not know what a Barker lounger? You know, anyway, um, I said, I'm not getting one. So uh, I went out to sleep number and we, we've had a sleep number for 25 years. Yeah. And um, we decided to get one where each side rises and, you know, and uh, that's, that's the newest joke. I told him it's going to change how we argue at night. I'm going to prop up, you know, and go, hey, get up here. I got something to say to you. <laughs> She'll come up and I'll start to say, she goes, I'm not listening to that. And then she yeah. goes down. And I go, what do you do? You get up here. No, I'm not. Okay, fine. And then I go down and then she comes up and goes, all right, what was that you wanted to say? What did you want to say? And I come up and she starts, I go, I'm not listening to that. I'm going down all night, up and down. Up and down. Oh, that's That'll a, be great. That's a yeah. funny, that's a great sketch too. But I think oh, it would be a great sketch to see it in a movie. Are you kidding me? That would the be funniest great. part of it, it would, it's, is how slow it is. Yeah, exactly. Like, let me tell you something right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and by exactly. the time you're up, she's snoring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I got that. We got the new bed, and um, uh, it came with no remote and uh, no no plugs. Uh, and my wife spent two hours and forty five minutes. She has the patience of a three year old uh, <laughs> when it comes to dealing with phone people. Um, and uh, two and a half hours on the phone and she kept, I guess she, she told me this story. She said, I kept telling them, you know, Amazon would have had it here by the time this conversation was over. Right. <laughs> it would have been on there. This is why you're losing market share to, to Amazon on everything, you know, and they don't care, you know? Yeah. You already bought it. So. Well, I was dead. It's not you. cheap by any stretch. You no, know? not cheap at all. But uh, the last one lasted 25. We just gave it to our son. He calls us out. We were just going to get thrown away. And, um, and, uh, the, um, uh, my son called, he said that they, they had bought a $200 match. I can't even imagine what right. that was like. And they're both heavy people. And he said, there's springs sticking them and everything. I said, well, then come get the bed, man. Yeah. He called us last night. He goes, oh gosh. Thank you. And they've had like a queen side again. They're they're big people. So they had queen or bumping in each other. Now they, you know, I used to tell Tammy, I want the California king. I want to be as far away from you as I can. Right. So I want to make a date to come over and see you. You know, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know we got to raise my voice to get your attention across the bed. Right. I, I'm, yeah. I don't like being, you know, if I'm sleeping, I don't want people, you know, there are people who sleep spooning. I can't. But you'll need it to get up, I assume, with the surgery. You'll need to. Yeah, that's. Uh, it's, I'm not looking forward to it, but I'm looking forward to it. But I can't sleep, and um, I'm, I'm not a big. Um, the, the, I tore my right rotator cuff a number of years ago, and it healed on its own. It took about a year, but it wasn't anywhere near as bad as this. this is a full tear. And I guess what I got. You, do you remember spurt. how you did it? Or was it just? No, oh, that's the thing. And my wife goes, "Are you getting that old? You don't." I said. The, the right one, I knew I was at a title boxing gym. I joined there to do some cardio work and I was hitting the bag like it actually mattered. Right. You know, I mean, I'm hitting it hard and then I feel a pop and then being the moron I am, you know, oh, you can just work through the pain. You know, two weeks later, I'm going, I don't think this is going away. Right. Went to it, you know, got the MRI and they said, well, it's a partial tear. It, you know, you can do surgery or anyway, it, it healed and, um, I thought that would be this one. This one, I don't, I don't know what it did. And she told me, because I, I was complaining about it, and I was told that I I was close to tearing my bicep a couple of years ago, lifting weights. So I cut, you know, instead of curling the weight I was doing, I cut it 
right. almost in half and then did a lot more reps to, to cut down on strain. Mm-hmm. So the bicep, he told me after the MRI, he goes, we're going to have to probably cut your bicep. And I mean, that freaked me out. And he goes, you know, Joe Montana won a Super Bowl with a cut bicep. So did Peyton Manning. You know, he said, it, it'll deform your, your muscle when you flex. But right. but uh, it'll, it'll take the pain away. So I got that and I got spurs. And it, anyway, it's just a, but the good news is I don't need the shoulder to do what I do for right. <laughs> a living. You know? So I just need her to drive the first one and uh first three gigs are the middle of september it's only like the meet and greet gives you the old shoulder slap uh, great yeah, show. Hey, really dug your show yeah. i'm getting i'm I, i'm 50 and i'm there's certain there's signs that i'm aging i i told my girlfriend the other day i said i just increased the font size on my phone so i don't know how much time i have left in this earth <laughs> Damn, he says. Damn, it's the size of that New York on your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like I look at her phone. One, I go, cent- oh. one word is like, I'm like, okay, all right. I yeah, go. holy cow. I go, are you kidding me? She goes, well, it's easier to see it. Well, yeah, but you, know, you get four words per, per page. Yeah. yeah. But in your book, you're you're very uh, transparent. Did you find it hard to, as you're going through writing the book, you're, you, you know, you talk about the marriage struggles, the marriage successes, the, the drug addiction, alcohol addiction, and the success of recovery and, and finding faith. Do you find it hard to like, should I really share this? Should I not share this? Well, that's why I let Tammy go through it. Um, and, uh, um, she sort of edited it. Like, Hey, don't yeah, the this. joke is I said, <laughs> I gave her the last draft. I said, you got to be okay with my version of what we went through. Mm. She came out of the bedroom after a couple chapters crying and said, I can't read anymore. We were really horrible people. And I said, well, finish the book. We, we turn out okay. You know, right, that's a good ending. <laughs> and then uh, she read, she read the thing and we spent, th- we did spend three days and over 40 hours going line by line, correcting my version of what we went through, you know? Yep. So it was, yeah. And, uh, but she was, uh, she was a good editor. She really was. She caught a lot of things. Um, she made me take the word affair out, you know. I said, well, what was it then? She said, well, affair would give a reader, certainly a female reader, the impression that there was something romantic, mm-hmm. and it wasn't. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, right, so like extramarital or, or emotional or something like that, right? You know, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, and, um, it's 30 years ago, but it's interesting how writing it, you know, there were parts that I just bailed on. You know, yeah. and went back to visit. I had a uh, a, a, a ghost writer um, help me edit. Otherwise, it would have been a four hundred page tune. <laughs> you know. So anyway, I said, "You pick the relevant stories. Help me uh, put them in the place they're supposed to be." And yeah, they give me the arc of the story. How does this end? You know, um, and went. You know, because otherwise, it's one big run on sentence for me. Yeah. So he was really good. He was good to work with. Um, I, I did the, a, another book with another writer, and it was difficult because it always came back in their voice, Ooh. and he didn't yeah. touch my voice. He, um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm I'm adept enough to write my stories. I just am not adept enough to edit and and structure. I, I I'm not very good at structure. Yeah, you have so, to have that chrono. Not only chronological, but does it make sense in the like you said, the arc or arch of the story? Right. Right. As and well. uh, so I wrote it really for millennials um, because the publishers always ask, what do you, you know, who you're writing this for? And I said, well, I was 31 to 38 that went the first half of the book. It was the marriage. It was what led up to my, my conversion, my faith, my conversion, my faith. Yeah. I converted from a hedonistic atheist to a, you know, right. a um, struggling Christian, you know? Um, and uh, uh, I just, um, I see it in the airports, the apathy and the, yeah. you know, the guy sitting there with his family and he's scrolling through his phone while his kids are running around. You run, want to run over and shake him and go, you're missing it, man. You're missing it. This right. is, this is, this is the big stuff. This is the yeah. big stuff, you know, yeah. and, yeah. uh, and the rewards that will come from that, um, far exceed anything you're going to get off the internet or the phone or your job. For sure. Yeah, I've tried to make it a habit of when my son walks into the room, if I'm if I'm on the phone, 
I, I'm I'm making a point to put the phone down. I used to be terrible at, at just continuing to uh huh uh huh. You know, not engaging them in that moment. It's like uh, really need to take the time to connect with them. Yeah, that's it. I mean, again, it's it's all it is. I mean, again, I sit at you know restaurants and I see families. You know, wife is dealing with the kids and the husband's on his phone or scrolling or whatever. I mean, he's just disengaged. And again, I want to, I missed all that, but I was never home. Right. And then when I was home, because I was, you know, the person I was, I was, I was difficult. Disrupting um, the routine is what you were doing. Right. When you right. were home. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. She made, made a point of that. She sat me down and told me, you know, don't do stop. anything. Yeah. And one of the things I'm talking about now is the apple core. I made a mistake of putting that in the wrong drawer. She couldn't find it. You know, I said, you core one apple a year. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know. I mean, it's, it's, so anyway, I said, that's it. I'm going to buy 20 apple cores. I'll put one in every drawer. So then for, no matter right. what drawer you go in. It's not it's like I disrupted your apple pie business. <laughs> well, that's it. You know, I mean, it, it was like, you know, anyway. And then there's time she talks to me and I have to remind her, you know, I'm not some foreign phone tech guy, you know, you can't talk to me like that. I'm right here. I'm your husband. You profess to love me. So talk to me like you do. Right. But, right. Uh, yeah, stop talking to me like I'm some phone tech guy. Cause I mean, she's, <laughs> she is just brutal. I can't understand a word you're saying. I know you're trying to speak and you're not speaking English. You're trying, but you're not. I need to talk to somebody who speaks. And then she'll go, where are you at? And then you hear her go, Denver? You're not in Denver. Is that Denver, <laughs> Minnesota? <laughs> <You know> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, I get, I get a kick out of what, listening to her. I'm in another room. And I go, oh, <laughs> boy, what, what's she trying to figure out now? Right. Healthcare, you know, whatever. I, they don't I make know. it easy, man. They don't make it easy. I just got a, a, a notification from McAfee, the... Uh, yeah, the you virus know. protection. Yeah, and I said uh, your 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 thing is about to renew, and I go, I don't have McAfee. I you know, four hundred eighty seven dollars. So now I'm trying to figure out how to get to their website to cancel it, and I don't have an account, but they're going to bill me four hundred eighty seven. You know, anyway, I, and now it's been doing. it's been a day. I'm sure I've been billed, or they took it out, or or that was just some fishing expedition i'm sure it was i was like don't click on anything your, your savings account's probably drained if you clicked on anything <laughs> yeah who knows hey yeah. i know we're running short on time but um i wanted to if you don't mind i got a couple of stuff in the book that really hit me hard and i wanted to kind of cover that if you got some time I oh, made okay. some, great oh yeah yeah some highlights here um when you talk about uh going to the meetings the a meetings this this line i highlighted here because it's it it you know, I mentioned before we started recording, I, I quit drinking almost two years ago. And, and you know, addiction is is what I, you know, struggle with in various forms. But it says, over time, I began to realize that the people in those meetings knew a lot more about my alcoholism than I did. Right. Which I thought was pretty profound because you think I'm the one with the problem. I know what I'm doing. I know how to hand, you know, I know. And you realize these people around, you know, more about your addiction right. than you ever, ever did. That that struck me. Well, the thing about addiction, and this is what I tried to explain. I had a friend whose son is addicted and he was so shocked that when they went out for a night, the son broke in the house and stole all their jewelry and, whatever and hocked it and i said you have to understand that's not the boy you raised right he's got a beast inside of him that needs to be fed and that's the way i looked at it it's a beast and that beast will not let you go not let up until you feed it and it gets to the point where you, you have no principles no character so you go into those rooms and every one of those people have been there long ago yeah and they know the lies we tell ourselves to protect the beast. Yeah. So that's where the laughter comes in. You go, you know, and, and then when the guy told me that I needed to quit my job to stay sober, it was interesting because I had a sponsor that was a comic. And um, when I told him about it, I said, I don't understand why I can go sit in a comedy club. And this is true. I could sit in a comedy club, not crave alcohol at all. But if they went out after the show and I went with them to a club or something, man, I sat there and I had to white knuckle my way out and I, I just couldn't, you know. And he says, what are you in the comedy club for? And what do you mean? He goes, what are you doing there? So I'm working. That's it. 
you're feeding your family, you're putting a roof over their heads, you're putting right. clothes on their back. You have a reason to be there. Why are you in a club after the show? Right. You used to chase women, you used to get drunk, you used to all these things. And the yeah. beast is awake now, you know. So anyway, that was it. I, I started telling comics, if you want to be with me after the show, I'm gonna to go to Denny's or something, I'm gonna grab yeah. a bite to eat. But um that's that's why you need people who have been on that road and they they know the science. They need to hear it because yeah. it reminds them how far they've come. But also they need to know that the lies, you know, all AA says from the beginning is it's a program of honesty. And yeah. the ones that can't get it, the ones that can't get sober are the ones that cannot be honest enough with themselves to understand that, you know, they have a problem. It's insanity. It's absolutely insane for me to pick. It would be nothing but insane for me to pick up another drink. Yeah. And I think it's, and, it was telling, and I've, I've seen this in other forms of in, in friends and families li lives. Um, you talk about how, when you, you had a brief stint of sobriety and a relapse, right? So it was like 30, yeah. I don't know what it was, 30 days or so. And you talk about the thought process you had, like, well, I might as well just go full bore and finish this bag or finish this drink, whatever right. it was in the store. It, it's almost like you you don't want, addicts don't want to face the shame of having to admit they failed or stumbled. Right. So they're like, I'm just going to go the complete way I was. And I think a lot of people do that. They don't want to maybe humble themselves or turn to, hey, I just made a mistake. Somebody help, you know, help. And they just go the other way. Yeah, well, they also, um, I and when you slip, and I love the word slip, but when you slip, right. they say that it's, it was never in the moment. And then when you oh. do the research, it begins a day, a week, a month prior. And I used to work myself into anger. You know, I I would I would quit for a week or two or three at a time to try to convince myself I could handle this. But I would work myself into a, a fit of anger and go, ah, "What the heck? It doesn't matter. I might as well get drunk." You know. Right. And uh, the funniest story about Tammy with her cigarettes. Um, <laughs> I I saw people coming off of heroin in better shape than her coming off of cigarettes. I mean, she was. Anxious and sweaty and just, I mean, awful. Yeah. The withdrawal was awful. So I got her some hard candy. I told her, you need to take care of the oral fixation. Mm -hmm. And I said, the addiction, I've read, I did research. She wouldn't, but I did. In three to four days, the nicotine is out of your system. And then it becomes really more of a, a habitual physical, you know, the, the the lighting and the, you know, the uh, and I knew that with cocaine. You know, I, would, you know, I knew heroin addicts that used to, in, in, uh, in, draw blood and shoot blood back in. They were addicted to the process of tying off and 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 going through the ritual of, of shooting up. So they're they're clean, but they just had a hard time getting off the needle. You know, I mean so I you know I tried to explain to her you yeah. had a, you had an oral fixation. So sucking on this thing, chewing on a straw, whatever, you know. So anyway, I come home one day and she's frantic, just frantic. And you know, I said, what's going on? And she looks at me, I can't find my keys. And I said, well, they're in your hand. And she looks and I start laughing. She throws yeah. them at me. And anyway, she, she goes over, picks up the bag of hard candy and throws that at me. <laughs> and she starts saying some nasty things to me. And I go, hey, look, if you're looking, if you're looking for me to tell you to go buy a pack of cigarettes, you're talking to the wrong addict. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then she threw something else at me, stormed out the door, went to flying Jane, got a pack <laughs> of cigarettes. And she comes walking through the door, smoking, and she's smoking. And she goes, shut up. Yeah. But I said, I will not judge you. I will not judge you, sweetheart. I, I, nobody knows how hard it is to quit anything yeah. but me. So, no, I said, next time you'll, you'll maybe you make three, four days, five. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. you know, just keep trying. You know, it's a, it's a yeah. stumble. I said to, you know, when I get to heaven and God shows me the video of me getting to heaven, it's just going to be me like one of those kids in the special Olympics, just running and falling and flopping around and, right. and people cheering, come on, you can do it. And then I'm like, no, I can't. I'm laying on the ground. I can't, go anywhere. I can't right. get up. All right. Start running. It's not going to be a beeline, baby. It's not going to be a beeline. It's going to yeah. be a lot of stumbles and falls. And why do you still love me? I can't figure that out. Why? You yeah. Know? But well, I think another great point in the book, uh, and this goes for faith and addiction is, um, 
you said, understand that the problems in our lives didn't go away, but the lens through which I viewed them sure did. So I think people have a falsehood that when I quit this, when I, when I, I mean, in recovery or I accept Jesus, everything's going to be great. Oh yeah. And a lot of, a lot of men, especially, you know, they, they yeah. put their wife through hell for seven years and then they get sober for a, a six months and they're going, why is she still angry? Right. <laughs> you know, I'm doing what I'm supposed to. And there was a time I resented the fact that I was always the one that had to, you know, do the recovery, do the therapy, do the whatever. But Tammy's a counterpuncher. She really is. Yeah. She dishes back what I give her. And it took me a long time to figure that out, man. If I, if I, if I'm loving, considerate, respectful, all those things that you should be inherently, but you know, I work, I work at, you know, she's that in spades, you know, and, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a, um, I just think if people realize the challenge is just, and the worldview, worldview is everything. I wrote something recently. I think I'm going to probably, go online at some point and read it. They, they want me to do some stuff. So anyway, I wrote this thing about answering the young man um, and looking back at the man I was and um, and responding to, to him uh, as a 70 year old man today. And um, what would I, what would I say to myself back then? And it would be just uh, seek wisdom you know it's all proverbs i've been reading a proverb a day for a while you know and, but and, and it's so funny when you read proverbs and solomon talks about pursue wisdom as if it's gold or silver pursue wisdom as if it's pearls pursue wisdom so wisdom is the is the the real treasure in life so but if you give, begin your worldview with there there is no truth and there is no no better method you know, it's, you know someone said that, that we're losing what made the western civilization great which was a uh, was a the hierarchy of values mm-hmm. we used to debate values we didn't deny that they existed we just we just thought there were better values than other values right right so now we're denying you know i used to say we were living in the age of hyperbole uh where you know that's all about clicks and you know headlines and stuff and making money off of hyperbole i think we're in the age of pontius pilate now where when jesus walked out of the room and jesus said whoever's on my side is on the side of truth and pilate said what is truth and i think that's where we're at they've they've yeah. successfully to uh blown up the concept that there's something true and um and when you deny that then you're you're really just kind of a victim of your own circumstances and if you believe that then you're you'll never find any lasting peace in your life um so uh the lens is uh, through a, a biblical worldview that there is a there is a god there is a higher moral authority that never changes so what does that look like well did he leave a a, a way to get there and then yeah and then to to seek wisdom means to seek people who have been where you're at and understand that, you know, no, you don't have all the answers, man, you know, and especially as a new person going into recovery. And that's where the title came from. Are we there yet? You know, I was in the, I was on a recovery journey, like the backseat of a car. Somebody else was driving the bus and I just kept asking him, when am I there? Come on. I want to be done. Yeah, I want to be done with this. This thing is hard. It really is. It's hard to to give up things, but once you give up things, and you realize that you know there's a lot of other baggage that you carry into these things, you know. And um, this side of what uh, heaven, I'm, I'm never going to be done. Right. I meet with a group of guys on Zoom every Monday, six or seven of us, and we talk about uh, recovery and things from various addictions. Yeah. Um, and, and I think um, like addicts and, and people that are not, you know, who don't have faith are are quick to, like the book says, you know, is this, the minute something bad happens, it's like, see, it's not all good that I quit this and that I found Jesus. Right. I'm like, but of course you're going to have trials and tribulations regardless of which. Well, Jesus didn't. He didn't say, you know, hey, you know, when you make this commitment, man, your life is right. done as far as, you know, you have all the trials. As a matter of fact, he said. You're going to lose family for your faith in me. You're going to lose fathers. Father turns against son. Right. Mothers will turn against daughters. And yeah, you know, um, I'm fortunate. My my father never even, it was 
it was a non-issue with him. I, I thought that was odd. If my son committed um, his life to something that profoundly changed it, I would ask him why and what was it. Yeah. You know, um, I heard a funny quote about knowledge and wisdom. I think it was an Italian soccer coach. He said something like, let me see if I can get this right. Knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing better. Uh, wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Ah, I like that. It's cute. <laughs> it is smart. Yeah, you can have book smarts. You know, so my mother used to call it common sense. She used to say your father. My father was probably a genius and uh, had no common sense at all. You know? <laughs> He certainly was. La he yelled a lot, so that kind of compensated. Yes, for yes he did. Well, that was his. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I miss I miss them. Uh, usually during the four majors of the golf tournaments, so that's really when yeah. we talked the most. Was those weeks? Yeah, my my father's really into golf, I, and um, I live in the same town where they have TPC um, in Ponte Vedra, so uh, I got to take him to players championship and he was just in heaven i mean i i i didn't know who anybody was i'm just i'm there for him oh wow. he's following the scorecard oh you know is it was it dustin johnson or what johnson yeah. is on you know because we're johnson's is it, johnson's on this hole so we yeah. get across and go to, and then whoever's oh, on this wow. and somebody got a hole in one he witnessed it and it was it was just really oh great. wow good for you though for doing that i i resent i Regret the fact that I didn't have the money that I had uh, until after he passed away. I would have taken yeah. him to Augusta for the Masters. And, yeah. uh, I finally got him to get a, a, a smartphone because at the golf tournament, this is a couple of years ago, he had the, not only did he have a flip phone, it had the antenna you pull up. I go, Pops, are you, what are you calling in an airstrike from a bunker? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Uh, but hey, listen, uh, I'll, I want to—I don't want to keep you too long. You're—you've been extremely kind and generous for not only doing oh. the podcast, um, but with your your flexibility on time. Uh, a quick funny story: I was trying to book you, talking to Lenny, talking to your publicist, and um, it, it took a while to happen, which is fine. And 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 then I see you're on Good Morning America promoting your book, and I was like, Good Morning America or Danny Johnson's podcast? Where are <laughs> Jeff's priorities? I know, and uh, you know, that was actually pleasant. I I didn't know what it would be, and it was funny. They do a thing called Faith Fridays, I so didn't know it, it was a good fit. It was a really good fit. It was able. I was able to uh, uh, say the G word on on network television right. without, yeah, you know, without. Funny story. Glenn Beck told me years ago. Um, he, uh, he went when he was at Fox. He had the number one. I mean, number one, far and away, mm -hmm. best show. Yeah, I like Glenn Beck. And I. And he left, you know. I said, why would you leave at the top? He goes, well, Roger Ailes calls me in the office and tells me to stop saying God. Goes on vacation for a week, comes back, calls me in his office and says, you said God 53 times. <laughs> <laughs> Went home and told his wife, they're counting how many times I say a word. Oh, you know, he goes, this word. isn't going to end well. So anyway, he, he saw the writing. I got to give him, I got to hand him credit, man. It took a lot of courage to do what he did yeah. to start a media company at that well at that time you know it's uh it's a lot easier now if you're you know yeah. wildly successful and then you go out on your own to get a, a huge following on of course on x and uh you know rumble and youtube yeah. and all i saw that. i saw a bit of your interview with glenn beck i like him i was good to see you on there um yeah but on the on this podcast i typically end it with five questions just to, right. not, not not rapid fire but a couple fire of them away man a couple of them you already answered. Your comedy influences, question one. You mentioned that earlier. Woody Allen, Cosby. Um, can you think, so you may have answered this one as well. And I read about your childhood in your book, so I'm trying to think. So I always ask guests, like, can you think back to your childhood when comedy sparked an interest in you? So in other words, my grandfather told me my first joke when I was nine. I remember him laughing, me laughing, the family laughing. And I remember the... Oh, that's humor. I like this. Is there anything in your in your? Well, I think I told a story in the book about my brother was a musician, and he had a couple of comedians open for him. Okay. Uh, O'Brien and Severa's a comedy team, and I saw Tom Dreesen work with Tim Reed in high school, and both of those were like, "Wow, I wish I could do that." 
Yeah. And when I went to college to play some baseball, I would do like what I thought were routines in the locker room about friends of mine back home uh, telling stories about Haggard and Corbin and those guys and stuff and, and getting laughs with it. But I remember seeing professionals going, wow, man, but how do you learn to do it? You know, and then uh, see, and, and then working for the jewelry company and then telling me there's a comedy club and then, right. and then hanging out from, you know, three months before I worked the courage up uh, to, to try it for the first time. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, you know, I, I think I mentioned this in the book after about a year, a guy goes, you'll never make a living at this, you know, right. You know, yeah, thanks. You know, yeah. Nobody's ever made anything of their life that didn't have some moron in the past tell them they wouldn't make anything of their life. So I, I heard yeah. an interview with Nate Bargetsy recently where he jokingly said someone at a golf tournament that was a golf tournament in his name came up right. to him and said, Oh, you're doing comedy. Is there, is there, is there any money in that? I'm gonna turn with my name on it. <laughs> like he was like Nate joked, like like he was thinking about doing it. Yeah, I might give it a go. I don't... <laughs> Speaking of that, I'm, I'm golfing with his father tomorrow. And oh, throughout nice. this interview, he's been texting me trying to find a tea time. The, uh Nate belongs to a, a really exclusive country club here in Nashville. Really exclusive. Right. And Steven is a member there. Um, uh, but apparently there's a he just can't call and book a tea time like nate can okay. <laughs> you know? that's what he said he goes unless i calls him nathan he goes you know if i was nathan we'd have a tea time tomorrow but we're we're gonna have to play out at the muni course at the thing you know, and i'm fine with that i don't care I, you know i'm gonna see if i can get us at uh, the course i belong to yeah. uh i belong out there i always drive by it telling tammy hey we're members there you know uh, at some point it'd be nice to stop and play around the golf it would be yeah. nice but my friends don't like it they don't like playing there so i always play with my friends and i never play there maybe i'll give it a go again golf ah it, yeah so question three yeah i'm sorry uh what if there was anything you can uh, wave a magic wand and change about the comedy industry? What would you change? Oh wow, the industry. Yeah, like for me, I think, it... I think the biggest change, and and I love the change, is the fact that the internet has changed. There's there's really no need for gatekeepers anymore. Right. There used to be four or five, six talent coordinators, and if they didn't like it. You, you never got seen, yeah. you know, and, and you don't have to live in New York or LA. So I think the internet has really made the biggest change. That, and and um, uh, you can call your audience, um, yeah. you know, I, and I think culturally it's not the comedy. I would change the whole yeah. censorship thing. You know, um, I just got censored. Um, uh, we try to buy an ad. I do a, a, a story about endorphins. You know, the Bible says laughter doeth good like a medicine. And I said, it has to be by design because laughter releases endorphins, which is the body's natural morphine, which morphine's a painkiller. So my goal is to get you to come to my show and leave legally stoned out of your gourds, right. you know? So anyway, uh, they were going to put that in an ad. I'm going to the Alabama theater and uh, Facebook blocked the ad because you're apparently not allowed to say legally stoned. On the internet, I, it is. It's it's. I you know. So anyway, to answer your question, I think the yeah. biggest change I would have advocated for fifteen years ago has happened. I think yeah. that the uh, there's there's David and Goliath, yeah. and Goliath has been knocked down pretty big, man. New York and LA. It's also no a catch twenty two. I would say too, because I've had many talent managers and agents, of which I don't have. I don't have one, but uh, their first question is not. Can I see a clip? Can I see your special? Are you funny? Where do you work? Is how many followers do you have? Right. That's the downside too. You're right. That is. So the I'm like, I'm working work. on it. I haven't been well, working rather on than, it. I rather than rather than saying, thing. rather than saying, hey man, I, I love what you do. I can build. I can build. We can build this platform together. They won't. You know? No. And um, it's it's almost like, what would I need you for? I could just hire a social media guy. I can answer a phone. You know um and i can yeah. grow the yeah so yeah. what are you going to bring to me what are you bringing to me right because they were like well we we can help you like i had a great conversation with tim you i think he's still your man yeah. yeah agent 
yeah. agent. Yeah. And he was, that's, that was his first question. And I was like, you know, I'm really terrible at marketing. I'm going to, I'm more, you know, uh, he's like, well, if, if you get the following to grow, we'll help you get bigger venues. And my argument was, well, if I have a million followers, couldn't I get into those <laughs> venues anyway? So right. it was a, it was int- it was a great very healthy com- healthy positive conversation but it was it just surprised me to get that question you know yeah well that's it you know and that's what got me back in clubs I hit up over half a million followers on Facebook and yeah. they said okay well we'll give you a shot and I I go in on Tuesdays Mondays you know they're never open and you know and I always laugh because I tell them I go to Yelp and Yelp says we're closed you know and I said you need to take that off that you're open Monday through whatever and call, you know, call for tickets. Right. Right. Yeah. So if they show up on a dark Monday and they go, you were closed, you go, well, we told, did you call? Right. Cause <laughs> man, and again, I don't know how many impulse buyers there are um, yeah. at comedy clubs, but uh, favorite place to perform place that you can't wait to go back to. You kind of, maybe it's your home. Wow. Yeah, I get that question. Um, Zany's pretty nice, Nashville. I love Zany. I love any show anymore where, like, I it's my audience. Uh, that that has changed. Wow, I I didn't realize what a big change that would be uh, psychologically. Yep. Just to know, I mean, they know Tammy, they know me, they know the bit. I mean, it's like, um, you know, and because everything I do is personal, you know, they, they, they feel like they're family and, and, and it really has gotten to that point, you know, and I tell the club owners told me, you know, these people, you know, they really like you. They really do. He said, yeah. we get a lot of artists that have followings, but these people, they talk about you like they know you yeah. in line while they're, while they're coming in. What's your favorite bit? What's, you know, can I hope Tammy's here, you know? Yeah. I'm doing a show at the Fisher center, uh, October 11th. Let's plug that. Okay. October 11th, Friday in uh, Nashville with Stephen Bargatze, Nate's dad. We're working yep. together. Cool. And um, anyway, um, it's a, it's going to be a phenomenal night of comedy. Yeah. Um, and um, I think if I told Tammy, if we hit a thousand, it's a 1700 seat venue. It was a big ask. But um, if we hit a thousand, 1100, I told her I'm going to bring you out. Uh, at the end just to say hi i said you can wave like the queen (laughs) (laughs) but i said you'll get a standing oh sweetheart you know you know that last question if you didn't uh i know you were you went from jewelry store to uh comedian if you never ended up in comedy what do you think you'd be what would be your profession holy cow it would be I, i i can't even begin to answer that just because yeah, I mean, what I had gotten sober, what I have, you know, wow, I I did try to join the military, so I'm wondering if maybe I would have, yeah, military gone into the military, would have changed um, certainly my trajectory um, and how I viewed life. And who, uh, who's to say if I would have ever? Yeah, I don't, you know, I wanted to play sports, and I wasn't. Um, You're a great baseball player, right? I was good. Yeah, I was good enough to certainly for people who to get drafted. I was certainly good enough to get drafted. I could have played. I know I know I could have played class A ball because I played against those guys a number of times and uh, didn't feel like they, they were at another level. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, if you know, I would love to have to think that I would have sobered up, educated myself and did something of value. Yeah. Um, you know, um, that was soul, soul edifying. Uh, I certainly wouldn't have been in the trades. I learned that the first summer I did construction. Right. <laughs> yeah. I would, yeah. I, I told my dad when I get out of college, he goes, what are you going to do? I go, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'll tell you what I'm not doing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, I got that's, a, that's a, a short list right now. I'm not trolling concrete. I'm not cut out for that. I have yeah. nothing but respect. Nothing but respect for tradespeople. My son does HVAC, and he see he had to finally get out. He blew his knee out for the third or fourth time. Yeah, good good chunk of my family on my mom's side is a steam fitters union up in New York, wow. Long Island. So that's and that they try. You know, they asked if I wanted to get my book and become an yeah. apprentice when I was seventeen, eighteen, and I couldn't have been less handy then or now. So I can't imagine. Right. Yeah, they're up on uh, skyscrapers. Yeah, my my brother did it till he retired, sixty two years old. I don't know how he did it. Yeah, it's hard work. 
Well, look, I, uh, again, can't thank you enough. Um, well, thank you. I'm you glad I got a chance to see you because we're working together. And when Jared had reached out, um, I said, sure, I don't see a problem with it. You know? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have to look up the date again, make sure uh, it, it's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll I'll publish this uh, this week and tag you and everything. And but if you don't mind hanging out for a few minutes or like thirty seconds after I stop recording, and uh, we'll wrap it up. Okay, great, thanks, man. Okay.